and welcome. This is In Stereo with Mike and Rick. I'm Mike Bovaird. And I'm Rick Miller. And today's special guest is the legend, the man himself, Mr. Nelson Pass. Nelson, welcome. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. So um, how have you been? We we haven't spoken for a while. How have you been? I'm fine. I, I'm out at the coast at Sea Ranch, and um, the weather is terrific. And I we just got two new dogs, <clears throat> so our yard is completely torn up. <laughs> And we <laughs> just kind of getting out, but the, uh, the, the, the weather has been wonderful. And we're, as I say, we're right on the coast. So, uh, it's, uh, it's cool here and nice when probably most of the rest of the nation is sweltering. When, when we get a 75 degree day, people think that we're dying and that there's a heat wave and it's all over with. So <laughs> <laughs> life, life is very good. Uh, that's good. I've, when was the last time you were at the uh, the factory? Um, I don't know. It's been a couple of years. So before COVID? Uh, yeah, pre-COVID. Pre-COVID. But um, I know Wayne and Desmond and Kent and the guys have been working very hard to um, get the orders fulfilled. And I, I know that things are getting a little bit better with uh, production. That uh, The time frames are still way out there, but they are getting better. Is that what you're seeing? Well, yeah. Um, I actually don't know. Okay. What, I, what I do know, <clears throat> what I do know is is that we hold lots of inventory mm-hmm. and, and always have, partly because we're a long term kind of thinking outfit, mm-hmm. and uh, it's good to make an investment in parts, right? And it, it solves some of the problems, but also gets you better pricing in the first place. So right. um, it's it's a it's a good investment. We have had some shortages. They they. Uh, uh, the lead times have gone out. And so, for example, I, I got a call. <laughs> Do you have any power cords? <laughs> <laughs> You're making power cords now? <laughs> well, no, but we need power cords in the, uh, in the product. Okay. And, and so um, I, I, my wife refers to me as the hoarder, as if it was something on, on a reality TV show. And I go, <laughs> It's not hoarding when you have valuable stuff. That's right. And, exactly. Um, in the case of the power cords, I said, well, you know, um, I have 500. How many do you need? <laughs> and that, that shortage was averted. So actually, um, I, 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 I function almost as a secondary uh, uh, storage source. That's, that's excellent. And um, can you tell us, are you uh, working on anything new? Are you always working on new designs and circuits and things like that? That's, that's all I do. That's all you do. Yeah, and, that's what I do every would, day. Would it be more yeah. first watt or more um, past labs? Well, it, 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 there are three. Uh, there are actually four regions where I try to divide my time so that I get some in on a regular basis. And, of course, there's past labs and then there's first watt. Then there's the do-it-yourselfers, uh-huh. and then those those projects that uh, would would not be applicable anywhere else. Usually, those are speakers. I like to fool. I started out as uh-huh. a young person fooling around with speakers. That's that's how I got deep into audio, and that's that's always been something that I do purely for pleasure now. Uh-huh. And um, so I try to allocate a little bit of time. So. I, I divide my time between those four things and of course my my wife and my dogs. Right. Right. And that keeps you that definitely keeps you busy. Um with respect to the speaker designs, um when you look out on the market today, what kind of is there any particular topology of speaker design whether it be a dipole or a um omnipole or or whatever, any type of design that you look at and you you quite like? Well, there's a sound that I like, uh-huh. and uh, very often it comes from full-range loudspeakers. 
And I think the reasoning for that, well, first off, there's a certain affection for simple, easy solutions to, to uh, problems. But um, if you, in, in terms of what I really like to hear, and which is all too rare, is a, a kind of articulation in the mid range. And, and, and this, of course, assumes that there's a balance, you know, a, a, a frequency response and such elsewhere. But in the mid range, it seems to me that the, uh, the phase response, the transient response in the mid band is something that I'm particularly sensitive to. Um, and so it, it becomes very special when I find a driver and or loudspeaker that, uh, well, the, the kind of effect that we're talking about is you're listening to a tune who, that you're familiar with, but you never could quite make out all the lyrics uh -huh. on it. Uh -huh. And then all of a sudden you're listening to a loudspeaker and you can hear the, you can make out the lyrics that you uh -huh. haven't for years known what they were. And uh, that to me is, is, a, is a very surprising thing when you encounter it and you, and you go, what, what is it that brings that to the table? Because it's very special and it's extremely pleasant to listen to, in my opinion. Um, and it would appear to be phase, the, the quality of the phase response to the mid-range. And there are uh, only a few drivers and only a few loudspeakers that, that, really, uh, that really accomplish that. <laughs> um, I have a big solar array so that I can run Class A amplifiers without any guilt. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's, actually, that's very cool um are there any particular um you know speakers from the past that you've you've really liked like it sounds like you would like something like a quad 57 a 63 something like that um you know it's it's hard to say i might um i've never owned a pair of the quads okay and so I, I can only speak from, you know, having sat in front of them when other people have owned them. I've always been impressed by that, but I didn't, but it didn't go down that direction. Okay. I have owned a lot of stuff. Um, in fact, right now, I mean, I, I have, about, I don't know, maybe five pair of speakers mm -hmm. that are, that are hook upable in, in, on short notice. And then uh, in storage, I have, I don't know, maybe, maybe a hundred drivers that mm -hmm. I have intent of playing with someday or played with, but had to set them aside. Um, so you like one yeah. driver to cover as much of the mid range as possible. Is that correct? Yes, I do that. Mm -hmm. and, and I say that just from experience, not from any particular theory that, you know, that that's going to be the way to do it. I have uh, at the moment, a pair of LRSs that do a, a pretty fine job of that. I've got, a couple of pairs of zoos. I've got <laughs> multiple louders. Most of these are, um, they, they may have flaws in the bottom end and they may have flaws up at the top in terms of not you know, either being too bright or maybe not quite bright enough. Many times those things are fixed uh, uh, with a little EQ and so on. But all of the ones that I have that I've kept, they all do a pretty decent job of that, of, as I say, the articulation in the mid-range. Uh, the other reason that it's a particular value to me is that um, it it's makes it a lot easier for me to listen to amplifiers, which is <laughs> the real task mm -hmm. at hand. In other words, mm -hmm. I have to evaluate circuit designs for, for their uh, subjective qualities. And... Um, and I, by the way, I'm not the only one in the company who does this. We, ha we have a, a small group of people and anything that we play with, we pass around and we share comments. So, but um, if the speaker's got that quality uh, in the mid range where, you, where you're just in very extremely good depth of detail, um, that helps in terms of evaluating uh, amplifiers. It, part of it is I like to listen to that. And of course, it's helpful if I, <laughs> if I like what I'm listening to on the rest of the equipment when I'm playing with an amplifier. If I don't, I might tend to blame the amp circuit instead. Um, let's see. I mean, I, I, like I said, I've owned everything. I've had, uh, I've had Dayton Wrights. I've had uh, Hill Plasmatronics. I've had uh, the, the MagnaPan products. I've had uh, JBLs, um, Klipsch, long, long list. The long uh, list. And, and it, uh, 
they all had something to say. They, they, they all brought something to the table. Um, at the moment, I at, at the moment I have it, it, I'm, I'm playing with something just at this instant, which were the our full range drivers from uh, China called Li. It's spelled L I I, and they and and my my Spanish distributor sent me a pair of these in enclosures, which was <laughs> very nice. Good. <laughs> so the shipping was probably more expensive than the speakers, but I fired them up and it was like up. Oh, there's that articulation. Well, it was a little hot on the top end and it needed needed the cabinets and needed a little stuffing to dampen them down a little bit because I, I guess the, the in this case, the taste of the Chinese customer might be slightly different. And of course, we find that that's the case. Right. The Japanese customer is different than the guy in Denmark and so on. But they had that articulation. It brought me back to, back to, back to that as a kind of a central thing that interests me the most. Um, it would seem my uh, my good friend uh, Kent at the factory. Uh, he's the guy who answers the phone when you call up. He's a great guy, absolute it, great guy. guy. Yeah, terrific. Um, I'll tell you his story sometime. But um, his 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 phrase, which I always liked, he goes, "Well, you know the uh, the best mid range is a full range, mm -hmm. and so uh, something that." Uh, uh, operates as much as possible at the full range may fall apart a little bit at the top and the bottom, but you can you can kind of you can you can you can augment that with uh, a, a woofer that's done subtly and, and similarly you can e maybe EQ or stick a tweeter on top of it. But it it, it, it the mid range is Paul Clip said the mid range is where we live. Mid range is so, yeah. all, all the speakers that I've loved had exquisite mid range. Is it because there is no crossover in the mid range where the ear is most sensitive? Uh, yeah, that's part of it. I mean, because there's a, there is a phase shift that comes with crossovers, and as you, and you can, like with Linkwitz, Riley, and so on, you can you can make it as gentle as possible, and you can try to make it look like the phase shift is simply a you know distance displacement of the loudspeaker. In other words, the loudspeakers you just move back a foot or something like that. You you can do those things and they help. Um, but often too, I mean you're you're you know if if, if you're crossing over anywhere in the mid-range, you're also usually dealing with a loudspeaker that is starting to run into some issues uh, above or below, depending on whether it's a woofer or a mid-range or a mid-range in a tweeter. So the, the phase issues almost always come in. There are some speakers that do real decent phase response. They they publish them, and they, you know, they, and um, I don't happen to have one uh, that I think of where there's a curve presented where the, the phase response is a really good emulation of, uh, say, uh, you know, having set it back a few inches or whatever. Um, I don't know. It, it, it's one of those things that you, you know it when you hear it. Like I say, when you can make out the lyrics to a tune that you couldn't couldn't before, that's that's a special thing. And 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 assuming that it's not been uh, uh, brought to you by something where they're accenting particular frequencies with a big peak or something, so as to accomplish that. And I, I've heard that too, but it's it's not as not as listenable. Um, Nelson, from an yeah, from an amplifier's amplifier designer's standpoint. What do you think is the biggest challenge facing speaker designers today? Uh, I don't know. Cabinet resonances, um, you know, cross. Well, but, see, that's, but that doesn't really come from an amplifier design standpoint. You know, the the uh, I can I can certainly delineate what what uh, problem speakers represent for amplifiers. That's pretty easy. Mm -hmm. But in terms of talking about what the loudspeaker uh, wants. Well, one thing that the loudspeakers do respond to or not is a, uh, is a damping factor of the amplifier. If the damping factor is very high, some speakers really appreciate that and they, and they operate more flat and they have a little bit lower distortion and so on. But in point of fact, there are loudspeakers that sound better if you, the impedance of the amplifier is higher. An example here is a, a tube amplifier. We'll tend, to, there, there are, 
there are speakers that like tube amplifiers, or, or at least they have customers who have decided that this is the case. <laughs> and um, you find that they, in those cases, the, the damping factors are not very high. Uh, if you look at the differentiation between uh, first watt and past labs, you'll see that past labs products have, with few exceptions, very high damping factors and fairly high power too at that. First watt is, oh, you know, it, it, it's 20 watts. And if it has a damping factor of one, that's too bad. This is what it is. And, but they, those, those kinds of products will still find their audience. But isn't and it so, true that there's no universal way to measure the damping factor, that some key companies rate it at a different value than others, and they kind of make it look a little higher than it should be? Uh well, it's, I mean, the, the, the notion of damping factor in terms of a spec is mm -hmm. easy enough. You hook up an 8-ohm load and you measure what the output impedance of the amplifier is. And routinely, that's at mid-band. So there it is. But, uh, of course, mid-band, if you're talking about tube amps, the, 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 the impedance will alter with, with frequency. Um, also, of course, it gets overdone. I mean, if something... If you have a damping factor of 100, I would say that's a high damping factor, and there's not a lot of reason to get excited about doing all that much more. You know, it doesn't become the goal in and of itself. I mean, there are companies out there claiming a damping factor of 10,000. I can do. I can beat that any day of the week. Okay. Okay. And for the, for the... I mean, technically, it's actually very easy to do. <laughs> do, do you I just have, use more have... negative feedback? Pardon me? Do you just no, use No, actually, uh, the, uh, I can get extremely high damping factors. I mean, literally infinity um, uh, with a little bit of positive feedback. Mm. And so it, uh, this was something that was explored by uh, Klipsch and the boys in, in, in the 50s, huh. where they were, uh, they were simply applying uh, positive current feedback in an amplifier so that the, if the if the impedance of the amplifier went down and more current tended to go through it, the the in, the the input to the amplifier was increased in in precise proportion to that. Um, works like glue, and a damping factor of you know a million is it, <laughs> actually you know at one point you hit infinity. And then if you apply more of that, then you start having a negative output impedance. For the purpose of the people watching, how would you describe damping factor? Uh, damping factor is the uh, ratio of the uh, output impedance of the amp um, divided into uh, the loudspeaker impedance. That, that, that's how you would think of it. But in and, layman's terms, it's how it controls the woofers. The speed at which, it, it, correct me if I'm wrong, the speed at which the woofers, you know, um, you know, go out and come back in. Is that correct? Well, um, the woofer itself will always present a, a limiting factor for that because the, the woofer, that response that you're speaking of relates to uh, very directly to the, to the impedance of the loudspeaker itself. So that if there's, for instance, a voice coil has got X amount of resistance, your typical eight ohm loudspeaker has got an eight ohm, a five ohm resistance to its uh, voice coil. You can take an amplifier's output impedance to zero, but that five ohms is still there. And so um, in, in that case, it becomes a question of uh, diminishing returns when the, amp the damping factor gets very high. If the damping factor is one coming out of an amplifier and the voice coil is eight ohms, then <clears throat> you have half the damping uh, as if there were no, uh, you have twice, you have, you have more damping than if there was no damping at all. But if the, but if the output impedance goes to zero, the, the damping on the cone is only going to be, you know, something like twice as good. So, so a, a damping factor of a hundred is, is yeah. considered high. Anything above that you're, you're really seeing a lot of it's well, a damping factor of a hundred implies something on the order of a 1% difference between mm -hmm. that and, and say perfection. Got it. Uh, so the 1%, uh, you know, it, it's not that huge. 
So people running around looking for the amplifier with the highest damping factor. Oh, this one's got 10,000. This one's got 5,000. It's be got to be better than the one that has 100. Infinity all, is going to yeah. be about 1% better than yeah. 100. Very good. Okay. Very, and that, mm -hmm. That's not to say that some people might not go after that 1%. Right. But like I said, it's a case of diminishing returns. Rick, do you have any questions for Nelson? Um, so with a, a amplifier with a load dampening factor and you have a reactive load of the speaker crossover, that can give you some frequency response problems, right? It does. Well, not necessarily problems. Well, I mean, yeah, changes. It, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, alterations in the response. Um, mm -hmm. Some people, some speakers are designed around that and, and they want a relatively low damping factor or there the other way of putting it is is that some customers like the sound that they get with a lower damping factor i would place them perhaps in a, in a, in a minority position but i have heard loudspeakers that do sound better with some resistance in series with the line so uh it's not unheard of and the fact that people like tube amplifiers over say uh you know really high damping factor uh, solid state or class d um that's part of the performance that they that they prefer yeah i've noticed in the curves that they publish in stereophile when they show the simulated loudspeaker load <clears throat> and they've got a amplifier with a low dampening factor you'll see that's not flat anymore it's like a, like an s shape yep. you know it yep. might have a boost in the upper base and then a dip and then another boost and so it's in a way it's like an equalization or a kind of tone control that you don't have any control over. Well, as a, uh, well, you do, I mean, you can, <laughs> you can, you can certainly go get a, a, an amplifier with a different damping factor. And then that becomes, you have some control over that. Right. But I mean, but, with the amplifier itself, <laughs> there's no adjustment on it for dampening. Oh, well, there's no reason hmm. why it couldn't be, but I've never seen one with it. Ah, well, uh, mm -hmm. would you buy one if I made one? <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. I, yeah. I think so. I have, I I have, uh, first Watt, I, I did, an, I did an, an, an amplifier for First Watt called the F7. And it was a, it's kind of a classic uh, two-stage MOSFET design. It's actually a very elegant little piece. Um, but if you, if, you, if you execute it with the lateral MOSFETs that, have been preferred by some audiophiles, which have quite low gain. Um, you, you don't have an opportunity for a lot of feedback in a circuit like that. So the uh, the output impedance can be uh, fairly high, and it, it would have a damping factor of like oh I don't know. Let's take example uh, the F7. I think the damping factor was about one or so, which is considered real low. Yes. Um, Oh, I'm sorry. No, it'd be like a one ohm output impedance. It'd be it would be like eight, for example. And I think it was approximately those kinds of numbers. Um, I though decided that I would employ a little bit of that positive feedback, current feedback that I told you about, and I gave it a damping factor of 200 with with one resistor. Now that. That makes life very easy. <laughs> yeah, well, that's about as simple uh, as it gets. If I, if I actually want a very high damping factor, I could do that. And not only that, but of course, that resistor could be adjusted by anybody. It could be a potentiometer on the front panel so that you could run anything from virtually infinity uh, down to, say, uh, almost no damping factor. Mm, that might be um, an interesting thing to have. Yeah, I think he's yeah. on to something here. Well, yeah. it's, it's not that it hasn't been played with before. As I said, Klipsch and the boys in the 50s were, were screwing around with this. They ultimately, after they, after they experimented enough with it, um, they, they decided that it wasn't worth pursuing. But, it was, but when I went back and looked at the, uh, the data and what they were doing and, the, and the, with the resulting curves that they sometimes got and they didn't like, I realized that this was the 50s. They had tube amplifiers mm. and the and they, the tube amplifiers had output transformers. And when you get down to the bottom and the top frequencies, the output transformers give considerable, they give some amplitude shift. They give also considerable phase shift. And if you start putting uh, uh, positive current feedback around a circuit that has uh, a lot of phase shift in, the, in an auto region, 
uh, <laughs> you get you get curves that start bulging in all the wrong places. And they look at that and go, oh, no, this isn't working. But their problem simply was their amplifiers were not of a, of a, of a technology that was capable of, of performing that easily. Nowadays in solid state, yeah, you can do that. Um, and the F7 is out there. Uh, you can still buy them. They're fairly popular. Um, the one exotic thing about that amplifier besides its extreme simplicity is is that it has a high has has a high damping factor that it otherwise would not have and again you could put a knob there for it that's Mm -hmm. interesting yeah nelson you've talked a lot about relying on both measurements and listening when you're designing can you talk a little bit about this well um of course (laughs) it's it's helpful if you don't know what you're listening to when you listen so that you're not biased and, and it's an incredibly easy to just fool yourself or otherwise be biased and so uh, that's one of the, one of the reasons why i send stuff out because when i'm listening to it let's face it i usually know what it is right and i've already formed some opinions <laughs> of my own although i do have a switch box where i can set it up and then do blind listening i flip the switch but i don't know which i've got until i uh have made a decision that I can go back and see later what it was. Um, in, in, but the, uh, it, I, I regard uh, the measurements as important because I think that subjective qualities will always correlate to something that you can measure. In, in, in that regard, I'm kind of a, an objectivist with regards to thinking about my subjectivity. If, if, I, if there is something about a performance of a loudspeaker or another component that I really like, or maybe I don't like, I should be able to identify that with a careful enough set of measurements. Now, I like to do that. And I've been doing it for something like 50 years. And I will say what I have gained from it personally is, is that I can usually look at, like, for instance, the the distortion waveform on an amplifier go, aha, (laughs) <laughs> this, right. this is going to sound like this and it, or this is going to sound like that and uh it makes life very easy for me if i have an actual goal in terms of what kind of sonic, sonic signature i'm looking for and um you still always have to go listen to it um because you occasionally just get fooled i have uh i have most of the time with a lot of the full range speakers and so on people tend to like some second harmonic uh, qualities to it. In fact, we've even isolated that they tend to prefer, uh, depends what you're looking for, for an effect, but they tend to prefer a negative phase second harmonic. In other words, the timing relationship of the second harmonic is particular with regards to the fundamental. And you can get, you can get it in two ways. Um, And they sound a little different. And uh, a negative phase second harmonic, it tends to, uh, tends to deepen the sound field a bit and give you this perception of more depth and maybe sometimes a little more localization of the various instruments. So that's, it's actually fun. People like that. Hmm. Uh, but there's another, there's another segment of the audio population that uh, likes the positive phase second harmonic. And that one puts the performance a little more in your face and gives you a little more detail. Now, these are illusions, right. <laughs> but illusions are <laughs> part of the entertainment right. that, that we're dealing in. Yeah. Um, I actually got, discovered how important this was when I, I made my first uh, SIT, uh, Static Induction Transistor Amplifier, and that was called the SIT-1. That was about I don't know, 12 years ago or so. And it had you, you, I had a knob on the front. You could adjust the phase of that second harmonic by just altering the load line on the sit just a little bit. The sit is the solid state equivalent of a triode tube. And you can do the same thing with the triode very easily. You just, you, you alter the amount of current through it or the voltage across it or the load that it's seeing. Those are the three parameters. And it will give you different characteristics of distortion. And in the case of second, you can have as more second or less second. And you can also have it uh, 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 positive in phase or negative in phase, and you even can pick the zone between where the second is nulled out altogether, and all that's left is some third. Hmm. 
this was a very interesting experiment because I built uh, 10 of them, which is five pair, and I floated them around and, it's, and it had a little meter and a knob, but nobody was told what this was about. And I just said, listen to this. Let me know where you like it. And the, the majority of people came back with the knob off to the uh, counterclockwise, which was developed a negative phase second harmonic. Mm. There are actually people who like it the other way around. And there are like people who actually like it in the middle with no second. But I found that the predominant thing was negative phase second. It was, it's an illusion that people uh, chase after in, in a lot of times when they're, when they're trying to deal with their system. Um, so <laughs> what we did is I made the spot on the meter and knob, the middle, that part where the people liked the best and said, here, play with it as you wish. And that, but that spot was a, a 1% second har- negative phase second harmonic at a uh, half power. Hmm. So um, that kind of put me on that particular path. But I've also learned that um, I can take something that, uh, you know, I can't let go of the subjective listening to this because the waveform may tell me something in particular. And then I still hook it up to a pair of speakers and I, Oh, gee, uh, that's not what I'm hearing or I don't like it or I shouldn't like it or whatever the, you know, and so these, these sorts of phenomena and, and looking at them on analyzers, they, they give you some guidelines, uh, but they aren't the, they aren't the last word. I find that interesting that people like the sound of second harmonic distortion when for years manufacturers have been trying to eliminate as many distortions as possible. Well, that's the other school of thought. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there, there's, there's a, a, a big chunk of the population who, who, who cares, and there's a big chunk that don't care at all, but, um, but who care about it and say, I want the lowest possible distortion. And chasing more zeros, uh, you know, after the uh, after the dot, is uh, a, a perfectly laudable activity. But we also remember that this is the entertainment business for our all intents and purposes, and so uh, it, it, it making the customer happy is a big chunk of of, uh, of the action. Tube equipment is a perfectly fine example. Tube uh, uh, tube amplifiers are, you know. Uh, shall we say, holding steady in their popularity. They, they haven't gone away. And in, in the high end, or even actually even in the low end, I mean, <laughs> two amplifiers sell. Uh-huh. Yes. They, have a particular, they have a particular sound that comes with them. People like that sound. Uh-huh. And as a manufacturer, I am, I am more interested in happy customers than I am in, in any other particular aspect. I can design very low distortion stuff. I, in fact, I, the first the first 10 years that I was doing amplifiers, that was, that was the goal. The, the, you know, the most amount of power at the lowest possible distortion. Um, but, you know, uh, slowly I, I, I learned to uh, appreciate that uh, some of the special effects uh, are, are not necessarily problematic. Uh, sometimes they're even desirable in the, in the eyes of a, of a particular customer. Um, so here I am at this late date <laughs> painting like Picasso because <laughs> you have I have people who will criticize uh, what it is I do because I have at least at first watch I allow some distortion in the door and play with it and uh, and and I have a customer base that uh, that uh, appreciates it but there's another contingent that says you know. My kid can do better than that. Look, <laughs> look at all that distortion. <laughs> and so, in that sense, uh, you know, we've 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 turned uh, uh, representational technology uh, into some form of art. You said something <laughs> interesting. You said that happy customers is your number one goal, and um, I can tell you from my standpoint, from a retailer standpoint, dealing with the great team at, at pass is, you know, that's the highest bar, you know, there's, there's pass and then everybody else below, you know, their, your customer service is off the charts, starting with, you know, obviously yourself, but Kent and Desmond and, and the guys, 
they're just top notch. I mean, it's it makes our job so much easier, you know, because if there's a problem and there's rarely a problem, but if there's a problem, they're Johnny on the spot to fix it. And the customers are never getting to a point of boiling over. They're just, if there's a problem, it's fixed. And so you guys do a wonderful job. So whatever the, whatever the secret sauce is, keep doing it. Well, I, first off, we charge enough for product that we can afford to do this. Good. In, in the sense that we can afford to devote the energy to service. Uh, when Kent, who has had this position for a very long time now, uh, but when he was put in the position of being the customer service guy, he, he, most of the time he will be the guy who actually answers the phone at the company. Uh-huh. I said, Kent, your, your job is you are the customer's advocate. You're not the company's advocate. You are the customer's advocate. And so your, your job is to, uh, you know, take care of the customers. That's, you know, and, and that, that, that for all intents and purposes is a job description. Actually, Kent is a much more interesting guy than just that. I, uh, I met him when I got a, uh, well, thanks to Kent, I got a tour of the cyclotron at Davis. Mm-hmm. When I went, I, I went to school at Davis and I, I, I had jobs, I had jobs commuting back and forth between the engineering building and the physics building. And in the center between those two buildings was this big cyclotron. And it was the cyclotron that they used in World War II to make the bomb. Um, and, it, it, and, and, and later, you know, many years later, when Berkeley, was, Berkeley and Livermore were getting the big, big cyclotrons, this little one from World War II still had a lot of functionality to it because there's plenty of research and actual practical things like making isotopes for diagnostics and such that can be done on a lower energy cyclotron. So I went back and forth, but I never got to go into the cyclotron building itself, into the the cyclotron. And um, so years later, I contacted by Kent, who he and the guy who is the director of the cyclotron are avid audiophiles. Mm -hmm. And they're building stuff in the back. And I was talking to uh, and I was talking to Ken. I said, you know, all those years I was there on either side of the building, I never got in. I, I applied for a job there once too and didn't get it. But, um, and he goes, well, it's simple. You can't go in there when it's running and it runs 24 seven. So that outside of the control room and the front office, you can't go in there. So, uh, he said, but you're in luck because it's going down for maintenance next month and I can take you on a tour. <laughs> and so uh, uh, myself and my son and Wayne all got a tour from Kent. He was the night shift operator at the cyclotron. He ran the cyclotron at night. Uh-huh. And um, <laughs> we saw the shop <laughs> where they were building all the speakers and stuff in the back. So and. <laughs> And and, and and as I said, the director of the cyclotron also is a, is a <laughs> Bob Keeney is a big audiophile. So um, I just got to know Kent, and then uh, we started uh, building speakers on weekends and screwing around. And then finally, the day came that I went, you know, uh, you're you're a smart guy. Maybe you'd like to come and work at Pass Labs. And so you know, we acquired him. Well, I'm glad you did. He's a great guy. Now. Speaking of building things with Kent, I want to hear about the subwoofer, the infamous, Which one? the big one, the one that Which moved, big one? the one that moved water. Oh, that was El Piper. We want to hear about that. <laughs> well, okay, you know, um, the, 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 the perfect transmission line would be, a, and. Um, I had at that time a listening room with a, it was a it was slightly over 12 foot peak in the ceiling. And um, at the, at the local hardware uh, outfit, they're not they actually it was on the other side of Sacramento, but they had those giant cardboard tubes that you cast concrete uh, pillars in. Mm-hmm. And uh, they're called sono tubes. Interesting that they would call them sono tubes. Mm-hmm. But um, so I went and got some of those, and they were um, they were twenty four. I think they were twenty four inches. I, I seem to remember because I had a 
I had a 24 inch woofer. I had a pair of 24 inch woofers, which were actually ripoffs or, or maybe they were the real thing of the Focal had a 24 inch woofer once upon a time. Uh-huh. But these came out of Asia. And so I'm, I don't know. Uh, but I bought four <laughs> of them and I proceeded to mount them in a big box, uh, one, a, you know, two, two and two uh, in stereo and put this sauna tube on top of it going all the way to the ceiling and stuffed it with uh, Dacron so that it wouldn't resonate too badly. And uh, it, it crapped out somewhere below 20 hertz. And, um, but, up in, but, but it was extremely, put out an extremely powerful, very, very low frequency. It was like a pipe, it was like a pipe organ. Uh-huh. Um, and <laughs> we were playing with it one day. And actually, <laughs> the water moving part is probably an exaggeration here, but uh, you remember Jurassic Park where the Tyrannosaurus? <laughs> My daughter was at the pond, <laughs> and we were playing with it, and she came and he goes, "What the hell is that?" <laughs> so, um, and and so El Pipos were followed by the Klein horns, which were a uh, a, a, a a single driver. Uh, it was actually initially a louder, but any other drivers could be mounted in it, which if you're familiar with topology, you know that there's a, a there's a, a, a figure that illustrates fourth dimensionality uh, in the form of a bottle. It's called the Klein bottle. And it is a um, it's a bottle that has no true inside or outside to it. In the same way that a Moebius strip, as a, a, you know, which is a circle. You, you know what a Moebius strip is? You you take a piece, strip of paper and you join the two ends, but you give it a twist before you join them. And then you tape those ends and you've got a loop, but it's been twisted. Mm-hmm. And if you start drawing on a pencil, you know, and, and, but never cross any boundary, never cross any edge. When you're, when you're done drawing the length of the thing, you find that you have drawn both sides. It has only one side. So a Klein bottle is the three-dimensional equivalent of a Moebius strip. So the point was is that it's an illustration of, uh, of geometry that could be fourth dimensional. In the case of this, the uh, the representation of the Klein bottle is exactly what this horn looks like. It has a big mouth, and then you go in that, and it loops around through itself and comes out, and you have um, where you put the driver. And so this is giganto horn, and. Klein, but because it looked like a Klein bottle, and because Klein means j- little in German, it was a great joke. The <laughs> Klein horn was huge, <laughs> and it looked like a Klein bottle. Um, that, as far as I can tell, about a year ago or so, it, that loudspeaker was on tour in, throughout Canada and then went somewhat to other countries. That um, it was part of an art exhibition. Oh. And, uh, 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 we were spe- Kent and I were speculating about that because we had given the Klein horn to an artist collective. I couldn't keep it around. You know, he, died, he owned the whole sound room. And I couldn't do anything else, so I, I had to let it go. But I, we gave it, we gave it and the uh, El Pipos to an artist collective in Berkeley. Then it disappeared, and now apparently, as far as I can see, that's the one that's on tour. <laughs> wow. So wow. Can, if you type Klein horn in on Google, it will take you right to it. Wow. That's an incredible story. <laughs> yeah. These things were huge too. I mean, you know, the mouth of the Klein horn was, uh, it was about seven by seven, you know, and I of course had a pair of them. <laughs> seven feet by seven feet. Wow. wow. Mm-hmm. Um, Nelson, if, if my memory serves me correct, you have quite a few uh, U.S. patents, I think uh, seven for amplifier design, electronics, and then maybe six for speaker design. Is that correct? Uh, I have one for speaker design. One for speaker design. Okay. I I probably would have had two because at ESS they applied for a patent, um, which was a variation on how to make a Heil woofer. Okay. <clears throat> Later became known as the slot loaded open baffle, which is, uh, but that patent was abandoned by C- uh, by ESS when I left. Uh, so all I had there was the application. I have uh, seven U.S. patents and one British. Uh-huh. Uh, and uh, 
of those one is loudspeakers. And that is a product that we call uh, the shadow. And um, it actually came from an old Arthur C. Clarke um, science fiction story. <laughs> right. And, and it was called, it was a short story called Silence, Please. And it was about an inventor who uh, was annoyed by, by noise, uh, probably his neighbor or something like that. And so he in, made an invention where he had a microphone that could detect noise and then it would drive an amplifier whose signal would be out of phase with the noise and thus cancel it out, making for silence. Huh. Um, in that story, the, uh, the inventor was killed by uh, the explosion of his apparatus. However, uh, I realized that it wasn't a practical thing in, in terms of, oh, we're going to uh, you know, make a, a room silent or anything like that. But with a, a, a woofer hooked to a microphone and, and the appropriate uh, uh, setup, you could uh, create a low pressure zone you could take the pressure down at base frequencies in various spots in the room. And so what we did is we put two woofers. We had a tube, another, another smaller sauna tube. You know, it was about uh, seven feet, just enough to go uh, with a little space between the floor and the ceiling in the average room. And had the woofer mounted in the top and the bottom, filled with absorptive material so we didn't have trouble. And... Each woofer had a microphone embedded right at the right in right at the surface of the cone in the center, and, and it drove an amplifier that then fed the, the out of phase signal back to the speaker. So the speaker actively absorbed bass frequencies. And if you put it in a room, let's say you had four of them and you put them in the corners of a room. You had all eight corners of a room where a loudspeaker was deliberately uh, 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 removing pre uh, base pressure. And this became the rough equivalent of, imagine that when, as a room treatment to get rid of room modes, you, um, you simply uh, cut the corners out, all eight of them, out of a room. And of course, this is where the pressure really gathers is in the corners. And uh, so you can actually kill uh, some of the uh, room modes that you would otherwise experience. And uh, it worked like glue. And I wow. got a nice patent on it. Wow. And it was a product that you sold for some years, but you know, it was expensive. And the, you know, the, 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 the rationale for people having it wasn't as strong as it might've been. So the, micro but, the microphone was to pick up, was it a longer, delay or decay in the in a particular base node and then cancel it or what was the it, purpose? it operated at base frequencies okay and the circuit was set up so that the uh so that the, the pressure at the microphone was either removed altogether or reduced as much as we can manage and that that gave the same effect as if you carved a you truncated the corner of the room hmm. Some people actually just put them behind their speakers and got, you know, a, a different bass effect. But, uh, but the idea was as simply as that it, it created a, a, a kind of a black hole for sound pressure. Hmm. Wow. There's some tricky rooms out there. They could certainly benefit from that today. I can yes, tell you that much. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's always tempting to chase some of these things. <laughs> for sure. Well, of all of your patents that you have, is there anyone that stands out as sort of like the one you're most proud of? Um, no, not really. Okay. Uh, they, 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 they're all, they're all kind of special, but you know, in, in the end, the, the pat, the thing about the patents is it's a, um, uh, it, it's, it's really a mechanism to try to protect yourself in the marketplace. Um, right. so, I, I I actually I stopped you know dealing with patents quite a few years ago. Let's see. I mean, the last patent that I got was um, well, I, I I got a patent for supersymmetry. That one was just too too good to uh, you know uh, not bother to go through the process. <clears throat> but and and of course we still have uh, amplifiers based on that. The, the patent has expired, <coughs> but the the, the 
the products from past labs, the, the amplifiers with very few exceptions are still using that. We have, uh, we have actually have done some more work in that regard too. So, but I, once again, not really, we gave up, we gave up on the patent office a long time ago. It became after the courts ruled that you could, uh, uh, patent software, which I'm not particularly arguing with, but you could also, they, they opened up the, the, the realm of what you could patent, mm -hmm. but they didn't uh, triple or quadruple the, um, the funding for the patent office. And so it became a mess. Um, and we had a, a Wayne uh, put a patent, uh, put a patent together that was for a, a solid state volume control. that was unique. And I thought, you know, great. And it took four years and they had still hadn't examined it. Oh, and geez. then, you know, when he complained to them, they went, oh, okay, stamped it as rejected and gave it back to him. <laughs> so it was like, yeah. We decided at that point that the patent office was not only non-functional, but was in a very expensive non-function. Yes. Rick, do you have any questions for Nelson? Yeah, uh, Nelson, I know that you like to use FETs, field effect transistors. Yes, I do. And can you describe to the layman or to anybody in simple terms the sound difference of what they would hear with a transistor versus a FET design? Uh, well, of course, FETs are a transistor. <clears throat> but what you mean is a bipolar Bi Bipolar, transistor. yeah, because I don't know if people would know what bipolar meant, so that's why I said transistor. Ah, okay, well, well old-time regular transistor maybe. But, yeah. um, well... I, I, I dealt primarily with bipolars up until the point where I founded past labs. And so if you look back at threshold days and <clears throat> the amplifiers I did for, you know, ADCOM and all these other people, they were all bipolar. Back then, those were the parts. Those are the things that you, that you could buy easily, you know, and, and they, they did the job. And uh, I started playing with FETs when they became, when they actually became available. International Rectifier came out with some um, MOSFETs that were uh, of, of much higher quality than, you know, than had been previous in existence. They, they, they started to become available and you start, of course, start playing with them. What do you get? In my case, you get two things. One, you get a, a part which has got a, a more of a tube-like quality to it than that of a bipolar transistor. And uh, that, that's got, a, there's a certain amount of affection that goes into that phenomena. But the other thing really that attracted me about FETs is, is that you could get very good performance with simpler circuits with FETs than you tended to do with uh, bipolar. Bipolar naturally leads toward uh, greater wow. complexity. Uh, a good example is the output stage of amplifiers in the in the heyday of um, you know the JBL T circuit and so on. They were they were, they were building more sophisticated amplifiers, more powerful, but they had to add more power transistors in series to do so. That is to say, you have uh, output devices which are what we call followers you hand them a voltage and they just add current to it and that's at the output stage uh, but then because bipolars drop current in doing so you have to come up with something that drives that and then if you're really dealing with higher power you got to come up with something that drives that so you have a you typically a triple darlington follower transistor that's three stages um I can do that with a power MOSFET with one stage. And I look at that and go, well, how nice. <laughs> it's, it's not only simpler from the standpoint of, um, uh, you know, having fewer parts. And, and of course, they, they, you know, in, in some sense, the costs, of course, are, can, can get lower also. But there is a, there's a, a one of my hobby horses in, in, in terms of uh, design philosophy is that simpler is almost always better especially if it measures the same minute simpler, that's, that, that's a given to me that simpler is going to be the better way of doing it. Um, the, the thing that is about simpler is, is it, well, first off, it's, it's more understandable. It's more, it tends to be more reliable conceptually, you know, at least it, when I look at it, I understand it better because it's simpler, but the distortions of FETs 
are simpler in nature than those of the bipolars. So that uh, you know, all of the things being equal, your, your, your harmonic distortion numbers might be the same, but with a FET, it'll tend to be lower order harmonics, more second and third, which are less offensive than the higher order fourth, fifth, and sixth harmonics, which are uh, representative of a more complex curve in the behavior of the, of the piece. They don't sound as good, or at least to, you know, to 90% of the ears, they don't sound as good. So I, in 91, when I, was, uh, when I was out of threshold and decided I'm just going to uh, you know, cut a new channel for myself, I decided uh, just going all fat. And uh, that, has, that has worked out extremely well. Uh, but, uh, and also there are some kinds of fats that not only behave more like tubes than bipolar, but you, uh, I mentioned SITs earlier, static induction transistors, a particular kind of fat if FETs act like tubes, then your normal MOSFET and the, your, the usual sort of FETs act like uh, pentodes, pentode tubes. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, uh, the SITs, and you may know them as uh, VFETs from when Sony was using power transistors back in the 70s and the 80s with well, the Sony VFETs and Yamaha had them also. They act like triads. And the triode is a is a bit different beast than a pentode. It's got it, it's got its own fan club. Um, I happen to uh, I happen to, <laughs> I happen to enjoy playing with them because they're they're really a lot of fun. Because minor adjustments can give you, you know, major differences in how the performance goes. Now um, uh, I've heard that those are no longer available. They're no longer in production. The V fits and sits. Is that true? Uh, at the moment, that appears to be the case. The the um, the last well the manufacturer was Token in Japan, and um, Token was wiped out by the Fukushima earthquake, hmm. and uh, as of yet nobody else has stepped up to the plate. So the only uh, SITs that you can get, the, I I scored most of the uh, remaining uh, Sony VFETs many years ago, and um, I have gotten given gotten myself a nice collection of what was left over of the token parts, which were salvaged uh, from uh, whatever the situation was after the, the after the earthquake and the tsunami. Um, but at the moment, there appears to be nobody making them. So if you are if you want to play with SITs, you have to go out there. And the prices on them have uh, become uh, very high, mm -hmm. although. They were never cheap. These well, the reason that you don't see all that many SITs in the marketplaces. They're expensive to make, apparently. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's why Sony and Yamaha ultimately kind of let go of them because they they really hit the price point on in terms of what you could do with product. Well, the FETs you use in your current amplifiers, uh, what do you see as the future of the availability for those? Are those going to be around for a while? There's, is there any problem uh, sourcing? They don't show any, you know, well, the, the FETs we use now are either MOSFETs, power MOSFETs, and they make complementary types. And those are the pentode types. And also, though, there are JFETs. Um, and uh, in the case of the JFETs, those are mostly seen as small signal devices. We use them on input stages and so on. Toshiba was the source for the best of the of the little JFETs, and um, they they still make some, but not not the ones we particularly wanted, and not in the packages that we like, and so on and so forth. Meanwhile, you do have in the United States, Linear Systems has stepped up to the plate and makes some replacements for them, but they tend to be in short supply. Um, years ago. <laughs> Yeah, I told you about being the hoarder. Well, years ago, we bought lots and lots and lots of the Toshiba JFETs because Toshiba said, next year, we're going to discontinue these. You have a year to buy all you want. <laughs> they were very fair. A lot of guys doing those outfits do not give you this level of warning. And even when the year was up, they went, all right, come on now. We'll give you another month. You can still get them. <laughs> now, I know a guy who bought a... Uh, uh, a quarter of a million of them and maybe more i'm not sure was that the and, late uh, charlie hansen well charlie hansen sa said that he bought a, a, a large quantity i i did not see confirmation of that but in the case of this other guy he definitely did because we've been buying them from him 
Uh, <laughs> well, good for you. <laughs> we never, but on the other hand, I, I personally bought a big buttload of them, as did the company. We're still going through them, and it's uh, 10 years later. Okay, so that's for the small signal JFETs, what yes. you've been talking about. The power devices on the output, are you having any problem getting those? Well, I was able to get SITs made by an outfit in the U.S. called SemiSouth, and they were of the new material silicon carbide. And with those, I launched the models SIT 1, 2, and 3 at first watch, and they were very popular. But it, once again, I was lucky that I bought as many as I did because they went bankrupt right after that. And mm -hmm. so that source has vanished. There's a rumor that there's an outfit that's going to be uh, announcing some product next year, probably with delivery in 2024. But that's just like, that's kind of a rumor. Uh, at the moment, if people who want those parts have to go scavenging uh, and, and paying the, the uh, price that's being asked, the SITs, well, the, the, the Toshiba v, uh, uh, JFETs is a fine example. Uh, they were 30 cents. And now if you go online, they're somewhere between, you know, five to 10 bucks a piece. Um, yeah. Well, the, and, the, the N's and the P's that you might get from International Rectifier for the outputs, are those available all right? IR has been, uh, was acquired by Vichet. So you, you're buying them from Vichet now. Okay. You can also, we, we used to get them also from Harris and Harris really made the, the best parts in my personal opinion, <clears throat> but they, they, they no longer do that. And, um, but you can still go out there, you know, and you, 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 you can buy them still. And uh, in fact, I, once again, the hoarder has collected a, <laughs> a goodly quantity for his, for his own use. We still buy the IR parts from Vichet in quantity. Well, that's good and, then that they're uh, available. So you use the all fats and then class A. Can you talk a little bit about the advantage of using class A? Well, we, we build class A and class AB. At first watt, it's all class A because first watt, it, and nothing gets beyond 25 watts anyways. And so it's easy to be class A when, when you know, the, the powers are, are low. And first watt is a started out as just my my personal pet project, and then ended up being a company. Um, the but the past labs product, which is the the mainstay of, or the main operation, um, we have a bunch of amplifiers, and they are either class A or class AB. And um, in the class A case of the class A, they're highly biased because, um, in other words, they're they're, they're class A to a very significant portion of their output. They run hot also, but they got more power than you can get in that package with class A. The advantage of class A is that it has the lowest distortion and, and the, the highest uh, performance uh, that you're going to get out of a, out of a linear amplifier. And it's just that simple. The, you, the bias goes up and the, the damping factor gets better. The distortion goes down and also the distortion character becomes smoother and smoother, lower, lower orders of harmonic. And the FETs are square law parts. So to the extent that they are true square law parts, just as with tubes, they, when you run them push-pull, they cancel their distortions very, very nicely. Um, so the, the, the Class A FETs are, are, in my opinion, the way to go, uh, unless you're really a very serious tube guy. So you um, use FETs, Class A, and then balance, push, pull. And is there anything else you look for in a good design? Well, it doesn't have to be push, pull necessarily. Uh, all of the past labs product are push, pull. And all the past labs, with the exception of one amplifier, they're all uh, balanced circuits. <clears throat> the XA25 is not a balanced circuit. It, it is push, pull, however. Um, the early past lab stuff, we did single-ended, but the market really wanted more power out of us than you're going to get from single-ended class A. So the, the, uh, the upshot was is that uh, past labs moved mostly to balanced, uh, balanced uh, push-pull, uh, big power MOSFETs using the patent for the sim supersymmetry circuit. And uh, off on the side, <laughs> 
I, I was building little single-ended amplifiers uh, under the under the label First Watt, and it started out as a hobby. First Watt is still mostly single-ended stuff, and and it's it's all you know uh, low power, but it's all low power. It's distinguished specifically from past labs as being low power versus uh, trying to do anything that impinges on the area where past labs is where we you know, put our efforts. Um, but the class A has got a downside, which is it's very energy inefficient. And um, that's another reason why it, uh, it, you know, as time goes by, I suspect it'll be low, more emphasis on low power class A uh, product than uh -huh. uh, high. <clears throat> There's things that you can do, but almost all of them represent some, some kind of compromise. Can you talk a little bit about how important the power supply is in a power amp? Well, that's where the power comes from. <laughs> <laughs> the idea is you would have a power supply that provides voltage and current at one exact value and no other. And uh, very few of them uh, are do that because it costs a lot. You're building another amplifier to, to use as a power supply for all intents and purposes. So what normally we do is we see to it that it's got enough, we've got enough, uh, got enough weight to the power supply, the transformers are big enough, and the power supply cap capacitor bank, which is storage, you know, it's it's large enough and it can handle the job, and it's still going to generate some you know ripple noise and variations on the power lines that are powering up an amplifier circuit. You can you can put some additional filtering there, passive or active, but the other thing that you do is you try to design your circuits to reject that noise. And so power supply rejection uh, of, the, of the active circuits is, a, is an important element of that. And to, to, to the point that you can have perfection in rejection of noise, uh, you're, you're, you're home free in terms of not having to put as much energy or money into the power supply. Running balanced circuits is a big help with that because you have in a balanced circuit, you've got uh, two uh, uh, two halves of an amplifier that put out signal, which is out of phase and goes, you know, drives the load from either end. In other words, one output is plus and the other output is minus going to a speaker. But they have the same power supply noise. And if that bleeds through into the output, it cancels at the output, which is, you know, in other words, because it's the same noise that appears on both terminals of the loudspeaker. It's, it's canceled. So balance gives you a little bit of advantage there. And, you know, again, you design circuits to reject noise and you design power supplies to minimize noise. And, you know, that's where the action is. Any thoughts on, you know, why now aftermarket power cords are so popular and people are touting the advantages of power cords, uh, you know, for power amps, preamps, all kinds of things. Uh, you know, 40 years ago, nobody was thinking about the difference the power cord itself made, but now it's like a whole different category. And any thoughts on that? Well, some products benefit from that more than others. You can imagine. Um, well, the other thing too is again, you know, the the, the people that were there are, are uh, uh, avid audiophiles. They 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 enjoy the equipment as much as the, as as much as the performance that comes out of the speakers. And uh, they, they are not shy about having fun accessorizing their systems with quality parts and, or, or things that you know, uh, uh, be, uh, speak of a, of, a, of a level of quality beyond the ordinary. Um, and I have no argument with that whatsoever. You, it, it, you can chalk it up to pure entertainment or, or maybe you know, uh, uh, enjoying a particular aesthetic about your equipment. I have seen stuff that was good enough to have made a difference. And so I, I don't dismiss the idea that something will sound better, but I'm a little skeptical when somebody goes, oh yeah, I changed the power cord and it was night and day. And I'm saying, <laughs> well, you know, I have not personally experienced that. And, and I've had uh, lots of opportunities to do so. Um, that said though, this, there's some nice stuff. I, I've got some uh, quad star uh, cables that were lent to me by somebody who oh, I'm going to have dinner with later tonight because he's got a different set of cables to swap out. But the quad stars were actually they, they come from Belden, which is you know, famous uh, straight 
manufacture of you know cable yeah. for all sorts of stuff and it was done by an engineer at belden and the the weaving of the cable is genius <laughs> and <laughs> the hardware that they put on there when you go to plug these into speakers you you plug them in and you give them a little twist and they lock beautifully that's really nice stuff and uh i don't even know what i don't even know what those cost but my guess is uh, they're probably worth it and um did they sound better? Well, it's hard to say. You know, I was listening to full range speakers and it was only a couple of feet of cable, but I uh, I liked them nevertheless. And so uh, I wouldn't hesitate to to uh, buy them. Mm-hmm. Nelson, if- Nelson, if somebody off the street, somebody who wasn't an audiophile, they weren't familiar with, you know, the industry, if you say, um, if they came up to you and they said, you know, what do you do? And you said, I build class A and cl- I design class A and class A, B amplifiers. And they said to you, what's the difference sonically? How would you describe it in terms of sound, the difference between a class A and an A, B amplifier, in your opinion? It's all over the map. Um, and, I, and I say that because there's really good sounding A, B and there's and I and I've run into crappy sounding class A's. So <laughs> by itself, it doesn't really doesn't really describe an amplifier. But 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 in terms of a generality, my my view is is that class A amplifiers have um, have a smoother characteristic, and I know that they actually literally do because if you if you look at the characteristic distortion and so on it's much smoother you don't see the you don't see spikes and and weird little uh, you know bits floating around in the distortion waveform you go i wonder what that is mm-hmm. um it's just you know second maybe some third harmonic and it's just smooth um so and, and and i know that that sort of characteristic is, is is inoffensive it's the kind of thing that doesn't wear on you some people even like it so you know but if you're going to have distortion, that's certainly what you want to have. Um, but also, you know, the class A, because it gives you the opportunity to get good characteristic with much simpler circuits, adds to that because there are now fewer components doing these same sorts of things to the signal and passing it on. So um, when I talk in terms of class A, I, I say, well, the, the transistors that are being, or, your, or any gain stage, is going to be lower distortion numerically, and it's going to have a smoother distortion characteristic, and it's going to um, it, it typically is going to offer uh, more control in terms of uh, talking to the load, and it's a simpler circuit. There are just fewer things in the gain path. It's just like if, you, if we were talking about power cords, you want to if you're if your amplifier is one foot away from the power from the wall out that you know, do you want a one one foot power cord or would you like a 20 foot power cord it's easy to decide that the one foot would be the way to go well class a kind of puts you into that into that zone of thinking about amplifiers um like i said that said i've heard good and bad of all sorts <laughs> and so this isn't the this isn't the only criteria by which to to judge but i i I like class A because I like simple circuits are easier to understand. They tend to be more stable. They're, they're easier to build. (laughs) They're easier to service (laughs) years later. I've got guys from, you know, who have old, old amplifiers from usually different manufacturers where, where, you know, the designer was just into getting the the many zeros and after the, uh, the dot, as possible and they build these very complex circuits and then 30 years later something goes wrong something's broken but i'll be damned if i can often figure it out because <laughs> the circuits look like the inside of a computer uh-huh. whereas you look at mine and you know you could take a you could you could sketch one of my circuits these days very quickly on a, on a sheet of paper out of memory and go oh yeah well that's got to be what's you know this is what it's doing and your problem is here or there uh so this is just, you know, th- this is an aesthetic decision to a large extent, but it's also a practical one. The only downside with Class A is power consumption and the fact that, you know, for a given power, you need more hardware, more heat sink, bigger transistors. You, you've touched on the power consumption of Class A and 
possible environmental concerns. One of the things I was wondering is, is there a way to build a system with the preamp and essentially controlling the amplifier so you know you're not wasting any more class a than you really need there's people that listen at you know 75 decibels there's others that listen at 95 decibels so the guy listening at 75 90 percent or 95 percent of the amp or 99 percent of the amplifier's capabilities are being created into heat or being changed into heat so is there any way to have a system approach where the preamplifier controls the um, like a sliding bias output of the class A amplifier. The first real amplifier I built was what I I, I believe I invented the sliding bias. Okay. Um, in fact, that was my first patent. I got all sorts of static in the marketplace about that. Oh, it's not really class A, or oh, I can I can hear the slide. I you know. And, and and then suddenly people began referring to pure class A. They go, oh, well, this is pure class A, not that other kind of class A. And by the way, this is still going on now because there are numerous, you know, hyperbolic curve class A. There's, um, you know, non-switching amplifiers and so on. And I, I, have, I have no issues with any of them. But what I know is that in the marketplace, there's always somebody going, that's not really class A. And... Uh, you know, and that that's just a trick and it's a fraud. So uh, for, first and foremost, as a company that has to take product to market and uh, sell them and have happy customers, not having, quote, pure class A, unquote, is a is uh, is a problem because your competition just you know points at it or 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 people who just want to be critical. They point at it and go, well, that's not really class A. That's just a chip. So I, I don't head in that direction because the marketplace has largely told me not to bother. Hmm. I think, however, yeah. um, there are things you can do. Well, first off, as a consumer, you can buy a, an amplifier whose power is appropriate to your usage. When, especially if you're looking at class A, hmm. there's plenty of low power class A solid state and tube amplifiers. I mean, uh, at first watt, we don't make anything above 25 watts. Uh -huh. And, and, you know, so they, the idle power on them is not huge. It's like, it's a couple of light bulbs. It's not, it's not that big a deal. You can, you can, and, and by the way, I mean, people think that they need much more power than they really do. True. In my, in my listening room, I have, uh, I've got fairly efficient speakers, but, but I have a scope and it runs what I call the one watt window. It's a, you know, the waveform at, at the speaker inputs is monitored and you can see from other uh, waveform uh, and from the peaks and so on, uh, what your power is. And the window is such that if you can stay, if you can keep the peaks within the window, top and bottom, uh, then you are in a zone of what a one watt amplifier can do. So I call it the one watt window. Hmm. It's loud. Yes. <laughs> you know, it's loud for me. Now, I, I got other stuff upstairs where uh, my my wife does her listening. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and in far less efficient speakers. And so, but um, at, at, on that system, you can actually watch the meters kick, you know, and, and, and uh, you know, if you, if you put on uh, some Pink Floyd and decide that you want to dance, well, then it, it can, uh, it can, it can start moving the meters. Uh, fortunately, I live in a place where I, that's not a problem. My neighbor is some distance away. Good. But um, downstairs, one watt. And, um, and, and, and people don't understand that, you know, if you have any kind of, if you've got a pair of clipses, you know, you don't need much more than a watt or two. You, you can operate pure class A and have no guilt about global warming at all. Mm -hmm. um, and, but people buy much, much more power than they need. I know we just had a gentleman purchase some 160.8s for his avant-garde trios, which are 109. I know, I know. Well, I so, have, you seen my little ACA Mini? Uh-huh. This is the ACA Mini. It sits on a little circuit board. See, there we are there. Yep. I power mm -hmm. it off uh -huh. of a glorified mm -hmm. wall work. It's pure class A. Stereo, five watts a channel. Uh, the the uh, the circuit board plus the Sammy kit is is twenty five dollars retail, uh -huh. 
and people are building them. They're going, I can't believe it. You know, it drives my feeling the blank. Right. Everybody's happy with the power. It barely does that five watts. Huh. Um, and when I play with it, you know, again, less than a watt. Um, now, again, there's, there are speakers that are inefficient. Mm -hmm. uh, but no, mostly people don't, you know, if they, if they all had the same scope and they all did that, they would find that uh, somewhere beyond a watt, uh, their neighbor was complaining. Agreed. Everyone thinks they need 500 thousand watts a channel and that's rarely net well i mean i did have a pair of speakers the ravel salon twos definitely needed a lot of power i think you actually had those at one time didn't you nelson the salon twos? i did not oh you didn't uh okay. th there's a small handful of speakers that i haven't had <laughs> but i had i had date rights right <laughs> there, was, there was a fine example <laughs> of something that required huge amounts of power um but, and, and by the way, which jump started my first amplifier company because it was designed to drive a stack pair of Dayton rights, which the in, investor, Joe Samet, who was my lifelong business partner since, uh, although he's deceased, yeah. Um, yeah. he had stacked Dayton rights. They were less than an ohm or in a lot of places. Wow. And he invested in he invested in threshold based on the fact that our amp could drive that speaker. That's a great story. Yeah, that's a great story. Um, so, so yeah, they're out there. I mean, uh, I have a friend who was just visiting yesterday, and he was talking about it. You know, apogees. Uh huh. You know, there was an that that in the same way that the Dayton Wrights gave a boost to uh, threshold, the apogees gave a boost to uh, Krell. Correct. Yep. You know, Dan Dan was close to the people at Apogee, and he designed amplifiers first and foremost to be able to drive those mm -hmm. on the. First off, because he actually there was a customer base ready for him, but also if he could drive the apogees, he could drive anything. There's definitely a handful of speakers out there over the, the past 50 years that have needed some power, but most today, they really don't need the kind of power people think they do. So I totally agree. Now, now here's a different question. I've never seen anybody ask you this. If you're going to get ready, you know, you're relaxing on a Friday night or Saturday night and you're going to be listening to music. What is Nelson Pass listening to? Oh, well, that's easy. First off, I go to the upstairs system. Okay. <laughs> I've got XA 60.5s driving a pair of SR1s. That system has been in place uh, ever since we moved in here. And the agree agreement between me and management is that I will never change anything to uh, about it. There are no cables laying around. The components are all still the same. Uh -huh. And uh, and everybody stays happy. Um, so I put on vinyl. And what I put on is, um, oh, yeah, a lot of loungy music. Okay. Uh, outfits like Jazzanova or some of the compilations from around 2000 or so brazil electro which is a whole series and um uh there's a, a series asian lounge uh these are all compilations but they all are you know uh, i call it lounge music because that's kind of a catch-all phrase that i that i like to call it but it was all um not quite jazz not quite pop but, okay. it, but it tends more toward uh Tends more toward jazz. Okay. Very cool. Rick, do you have any questions for Nelson? Yeah. <clears throat> you said you're always working on things and thinking about things you're going to be doing. Is there anything you can share with us in a very general term that won't give anything away about what you're looking at for future products? Oh, yeah. Well, you know, once upon a time I did something. Oh, well, future product, hell, I don't. We, it's, it's the same thing. <laughs> it's the same thing charted up. In, in, you know, with some level of improvement, I had there is a new there are revisions to uh, past labs product that will you know show up in the future here that I these are a constant stream of things but when they accumulate to be enough then we stick another digit on whatever the models are and do an engineering change order and I uh, we're in testing on some pieces now that would I think give us some improvements long term. In the case of first watt, um, more SIT product, more more amplifiers that are, operate off those static induction transistors. And, and, uh, 
let's see what else have I got cooking. Um, I maintain a list on a spreadsheet. <laughs> it reminds me of what it is that I either should be working on or that I want to work on. Um, probably nothing this year. I don't think right a, I don't think a week goes by where somebody doesn't ask me if we have a, a past crossover. I guess that's a product we may not see again. All the time. All the time we get called. Well, there was the XVR. The XVR, yeah. And uh, and and unfortunately, I, I honestly, you know, I don't run past labs in the sense that I tell people what to do. We have uh, <laughs> nobody wants to be president of the company either. So it's one of those jobs that people end up with. And uh, you have to understand too that people at past labs go way back. I mean, we have we have people and ownership that go back all the way to ESS. So all the way back to 72, including my wife, I might add, who I met at ESS. Okay. Um, and, and, and not only that, but as they get old and start retiring, their, their kids become involved in the company. And at the moment, the president of the company is the daughter of the lady who was the accountant at, uh, or an accountant at ESS, and then later the accountant at Threshold, and then subsequently uh, married Joe Samet, who was one of the principals at uh, uh, Threshold. And then, um, I'm sorry, and, and yeah, at Threshold. We bought him out. He went over to Krell. Right. <laughs> and proceeded to kick our ass in the marketplace <laughs> for a few years. But, we, but I got him back Good. after I formed Past Labs. So, but, but we have people who go all the way back. Currently, the president of the company is uh, Anastasia, who is the daughter of the woman who was the accountant through all these years. She, do, she was an accountant at uh, Hewlett Packard and decided the big corporate life was uh, not necessarily as attractive as coming over to past labs. And she's so good, I, we made her president. Um, now I'm telling you this story why. Oh, well, the point really is, is that it, I, if it were just me, I would go, yeah, well, we need to have the XVR one, but it isn't just me making these decisions. And I haven't had, well, because I have one already, but the, 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 the need for one in the marketplace hasn't become as apparent uh, to me. Uh, I would actually like to revise the uh, XVR one. And um, I did several crossovers at first watch. I did the V... Um, Let's see, there was a B5, oh, B4 and a B5, which were, were kind of popular. But at some point, I, I, I thought maybe everybody who really wanted one had gotten one. And um, it's more likely that we would do a Past Labs product because... Um, well, we would tell you that we're, we're definitely getting a lot of calls. We, we get a call a week from somebody saying, do you have one laying around? If you get one, take down my name and number. I need one. Now, if we come out with this, I'm going to come back. And, and I'm going to buy 10. Two, you're buying them. You know that. <laughs> I'm buying 10 of them right away. <laughs> and we're going to call all those people back. Yeah, they'll sell so quick. Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, it's on my to-do list. Okay. Oh, I like, like I said, I keep a spreadsheet that mm -hmm. has the to-do list on it. So it's, you know. Well, move it up in its order. Yeah, we need it. <laughs> well, let's see. Maybe I could look that up. No, I don't have it up in live right now. But, no, that's um, okay. No, I thought it was a very nice piece. And, and a lot of uh, a lot of people in the industry who design speakers ended up with it. Yep, that's right. Because it was quite convenient to get what you want. I think it was last year or the year before we actually had one come in. Um, our yep. customer, Howard, didn't need it anymore. And uh, he downsized or changed something in the system. And uh, I think it went in literally 30 minutes. It was, it was like gone. an hour. An hour. Yeah. It was gone. Yeah. 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 It was quick. And then really quick. Yep. Yeah. So. Um, well, right. I, I actually have a, you know, a, a, an initial layout. And I, you know, I have done some work on this because it, it has some attraction. But I don't know. It just competes with. So many other things. All, yeah. All the other things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Rick, any other questions for Nelson? Um, I was just going to say, I know you're on DIY audio. You have a forum there, past labs forum. 
and you have the amp camp stuff that you do at the burning amp festival and i think that's really great that someone of your stature and your you know position in design goes and helps the guys that are just starting out and you know just the common man you know that you're accessible and i just wanted to thank you for that well it's um thank you uh but you know it, it's just a pleasure for me to do this i i'm the kind of guy who likes to build stuff that's that's really <laughs> where where it all came from and, and the other thing too is is that uh the, the DIYers, you know, I get back quite a bit for for my efforts. I mean, first off, I get to try all sorts of stuff that I would not really be practically able to put out in the marketplace. So a lot of designs that I think are interesting or cool, I can, without bothering the people who have to produce real product at, back at the factory, I... Um, I just I put it out to the DIYers and in the form of some kind of kit, and I get some help with that. Uh, the other thing too is is that I get a lot from the DIYers in in the in the in the, in, the, in the sense of uh, information. Uh, how did I find uh, those SITs that were floating around, or the Sony V Pets, or some of these other parts that are exotic and have been good for me? Um, I often as not there's some do-it-yourselfer who online goes oh mr pass have you seen this and they'll point a link to something and i'll go and i go oh well no i had not thank you very much and so i get lots of information back not only that kind of information but also people tell me what they think they tell me what they like they tell me what they don't like or what works and doesn't work this is very valuable stuff because we tried to make product with the idea of appealing to people who would be those sorts of people who, you know, are potential customers or who are customers. So the, the communication with DIYers is very much a, uh, is a two way street. Good. So good. I, I get as much out in my opinion as I, as I give. Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear that because I know that everybody that follows you and looks at your designs and your DIY stuff they're all very grateful that you do that because I don't know any other designer that does do that. So thank you, Nelson. There are some really sharp guys doing that also, but uh, they're probably not as uh, commercially visible. Yeah. Nelson, um, um, I just wanted to say, you know, thank you very much for your time today. Um, we are at Suncoast Audio, very proud Past Labs dealer. I know that we've had the, the ability to play with a lot of the products and listen to a lot of the amplifiers and the new pre-amplifiers are fantastic. Uh, the 12, the 22, and the 32 are unbelievably good pre-amplifiers. And the phono stages for, for Mike and I as hardcore oh, vinyl guys, we're, we, we borrowed a uh, XP-17 yeah. from Kent. Uh, for the Florida Audio Expo in February, and we just looked at each other and said, how much is this thing? We couldn't believe how good it was. It's incredible. And, and instantly ordered the XP27 <laughs> to go along mm -hmm. with it. So um, hats off to the entire team at Pass for these great new products that have, uh, that have been coming out, and the integrateds are phenomenal as well. Um, our challenge is to convince people that the INT60 is pretty much uh, all they'll ever need, but of course they all usually go for the 250 um but uh, they're both great products and they sound a little bit different you know and um we'd be hard pressed to pick one over the other so um hats well, you, off to you, you guys you appreciate that you're talking about wayne's work here i know i know <laughs> wayne, wayne designs wayne designs the preamps if yep. it's, if, whether it's a phono stage or uh, you, know, you know anything else that relates to preamps and for that matter the uh, integrateds are uh, at least 50% his work because he takes, you know, in, in the case of like INT60, he takes the channels from a existing amplifier, but then turns it into an integrated. So we have to give lots of praise to Wayne. Absolutely. Who, who is too modest to claim it, 
but you know he's hiding in the background he doesn't really he's not out front and saying a lot of things but i know in the background he's building some incredible preamps and phono stages uh, i did actually have one more question the john atkinson review of the xa i think it was john atkinson reviewed the xa 60.8 um, amplifiers and in that review his measurements showed that they were much more powerful than the 60 watts claimed did you did you see that uh, well, that's routine. Okay, I so, mean, that's not that's not a surprise. We have a few that are, when we say it's this many watts, it's not all that much more. But most of the time, we we we're able to build margin in. Part of it too is we are we we run that class A power definition typically by the point at which something starts leaving class A. When okay, it, when, you know, so and it, it it has a very slow approach to that. And the FETs, are, their square law character of FETs gives us some advantage with, with, with you know, extending the, the envelope a bit. But uh, usually we, um, you know, we, we, we try to be uh, as generous as possible with, on the margin. And, and like I said, some of that is, we, it's like seriously class A up to that point. So when you look at an XA product and says XA60 and it really does 80, uh, Somewhere above sixty, it's thought it'll, it'll think about leaving class A. It'll be uh, dependent on the wattage. Unless I'm uh, wrong, he measured it at 122 or something watts per channel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't he's worry. A, he's it's a, all watts. He's got a, don't worry he's got a strong AC line, I guess. <laughs> well, I, we have a pair of those in the store as well, and I can tell you they'll drive anything we have in the store. Anything. So, I had one guy who uh, you know came out and said. Past Labs is obviously faking their results because <laughs> they're they're doing much more power than than it says. Right. The response to that was along the lines of, "And the problem is what?" <laughs> yeah. Um, no. Well, you know, we certainly appreciate you, uh, Michael, as a, as a dealer. Thank you. And so, uh, you know, the Kent immediately just came and went. Michael wants an interview on Zoom. <laughs> Uh, Kent is yeah, my regular breakfast partner at the shows. <laughs> Kent gets dragged to breakfast every time I go to the shows, and, and we <laughs> and uh, we have a we have a really good uh, time and a good relationship. So, um, thank you again for today, um, and uh, really appreciate you being on. And keep up all the the great stuff, and we'll look forward to seeing what's next from uh, First Watt and uh, Past Labs. I'll move the XDR up a notch on that. Slip. We would That's appreciate that. it. Yeah, we please. Would appreciate it. <laughs> well, thanks again, Nelson. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Nelson. Thank you. Thanks so much. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.